Welcome no. back to another episode of the Producer Grind Podcast. Karen, to with me as usual. Yo. And please welcome our brand new host who's going to be here with us from now on. Oh. The one and only D Sims. Oh. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. We got a, also got a special guest here in the building. This man has worked with Jeezy, Kevin Gates, Lil Bibby, Meek Mill, Royce the Five Nine, Cool G Rap, Public Enemy, Ray Swimmer, Ludacris, Rick Ross, Soldier Boy, Wendy's. Please welcome to the show DJ Payne One. That Wendy's card throws me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the favorite one. That's the one I want to know about the most. I, and it's the one that I know the littlest about. So mm. it's ironic. Mm. I'll move my just a little bit. Yes, for everyone you think watching. I would know how to do this. We are talking about the Baconator Wendy's. <laughs> not yes, some actual artists. life Wendy's. <laughs> we'll, not just Wendy's. We'll get to that. But, um, you know, talk to us. You know what I mean? For those of us that may not be familiar, talk about, you know, specifically your transition from, you know, being a part-time guy, part-time music guy, having to have a job to, you know, obviously becoming a full-time music producer. I had, I think at, at my peak, I had three jobs and I was in grad school. That's why we had that conversation. Earlier. Oh, wow. Ooh. Um, but my whole thing was I just gave myself a year. So I I finished a, a bachelor's degree in education, and um, being a teacher, a high school teacher at that, that's a commitment. Mm. And so I knew that if I was going to make that commitment, I had to choose between music and and that. Mm. And I had been making music for so long, but I never thought I could be a career musician. It just because where I'm from, you know, very rarely is anyone a career musician. So and where it, are you from? Uh, Madison, Wisconsin. So it seemed, you, you know, and we have, you know, like Rigo Love is from Milwaukee, for example. Tony Neal. You know, there are a lot of people from Milwaukee, but I think just in our state, we don't see ourselves as, um, you know, as as potential career musicians. Like that's not a potential leave career path. Yeah, yeah. and so right. if, you know, my whole life I had just wanted to be a teacher, and then right at the time that I graduated it kind of struck me that I had invested so much time and, and energy into making music. Mm. And then the other thing was we had, I don't want to get too political, but we had basically a Republican takeover of our, of our state. And so the, and I think maybe you had something similar. I know a lot of states did around that time. So that teachers and anyone in a union, any kind of state or city employee was feeling a lot of pressure and you know pensions and and salaries and protection and so forth were were all on the chopping block so mm. i kind of looked at it like well am i ready to jump into that world cuz it was going to take a lot to even get into you know the district so i just gave myself a year i said look if you can work harder than you've ever worked and focus on becoming a professional maybe you can do it and then w- within i think 7 months of that and i cheated because i i became I enrolled in grad school kind of in the, in the meantime, but within that period, that's when I got the call from my very first manager who's here out here, Brandon from, from Toronto, first manager for, for T minus as well. Mm. And the weekend as well, back mm. when he was with the noise, mm. he, he gave me the call from Canada, said I was on the GZ album and, and the rest is history. Mm. Mm. So he was the one that kind of shot that beating out of placement for you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where to, it was all just kind of, mm. You know, no one knew what we were doing, and I, it was just the right record at the right time with the right feeling. And you know, I think he shopped it through uh, Jesus Engineer, so it wasn't even really a traditional channel by which beats get placed normally. Mm. So, how long had you been making beats at this point? Like from the beginning to where you kind of take it to serious. I know you're talking about you're in grad school, so that's what twenty five, twenty six, something like that. Well, I did. I had five years because of the education program oh, for my okay. undergrad, so it was a little longer. But I remember I made my first beat in '98, but I can't really say that's when I started making beats because I, you know, it was just kind of something I wanted to do for fun, and I never mm-hmm. committed fully. But I think throughout high school, like I did albums in high school and in college too. I think probably around age 19 is when it got a little more serious when we started performing and forming groups and actually putting money into manufacturing CDs, that kind of thing. Mm. So you guys had, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. So you guys had been kind of taking it serious. Like you said, you made it in 98, which is like the year before I was born, which is crazy, which is 20 yeah. something years. For future reference, you can, you can withhold Leave comments that. like that. <laughs> <laughs> Leave that out. But yeah, so you guys, what made you decide to take it more serious and start putting investing into it and going into shows rather than just, you know, staying in your room, just being like, oh, this is kind of a hobby. 
competition, honestly. It was just we saw other people doing it and we just wanted to do it. You know, I had friends that were rappers. I had friends that were DJs. So as I think that's what's dope about the hip hop culture is just this competitive spirit. There, there was no malice involved. It wasn't anything negative. It was just a need to be out there, I guess, proving ourselves artistically. And, you know, I was doing all types of stuff. I was a graffiti artist. You know, so there's just there was this competitive element in in all of the artistic expressions that that we participated in. So it made sense to just put ourselves out there. Do you feel like the competition level is higher nowadays than it was back then? Uh, it depends what the context is, yeah. Like, as far as you think it's more driven to get um, big placements and kind of that fame and superstardom, or is it still at the core driven by competition? Just only yeah, based on, like, it, best music. I think we have more competitive avenues now because now it's who has the best music, who has the best branding, who has the best marketing, who mm. has the best SEO. Who has so, the most followers. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So there are all these new chances to compete. And it, I think that's why it gets so overwhelming for people these days. Mm. Mm. So talk to us about, you know, you got the GZ placement where you 100% sold. Like, okay, yep, I, I completed what I said. As far as, you know, I got to do this in a year. What was your mindset at that point? Oh, yeah. No, I definitely, I remember I had a show somewhere in northern Wisconsin. I was sitting on the Mississippi River and I'm like, yeah, life is different now. <laughs> I don't know, like, I don't know where I'm going to be in a year. And then in a year, I was still doing the same thing. So um, it, it took me a while. I mean, I, I think at that point, I kick myself pretty much every day for not seeing the writing on the wall. And I was involved in, in mp3.com early on, okay. but not as a producer. But I was uploading audio and, and other kinds of content mm. to the internet. So it's just, and I was, I was running ads when I was a little kid, like uh, I think 14 or 15, I learned how to, to um, which probably was against their policy or something because I was so young, but make websites and advertise with it and stuff. Cause, cause I was not a nerd. I wasn't academic at all, but I went to a, a charter school where they taught us technology. Sorry, man. I'm just, uh, with that damn phone. Um, phone. Cause I know it picks up, but so I learned a little bit and there were these early ad revenue platforms that, that you could work with. So I did that. And like, I felt like the man at age, you know, 13, 14, cause I can make $30 a month off of banner ads. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I don't know why I didn't, you know, I've only been doing the, the online beat sales things for like a year. Honestly, mm -hmm. I learned, I learned all about it last year at A3C. Mm -hmm. And so here I am a year later. That's kind of weird because I feel like a lot of people consider you like an internet producer kind of thing. Oh, I don't think so. No? I guess maybe it's just because you know you're outspoken, you got your content and stuff like that. Because that came, that's, that's older than a year. I know that for a fact. Yeah, no, I, I was doing that before my first placement. I was putting, but that was because I was working at a program on campus. It was like a pipeline program for kids who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford um, to attend the university. So it was a, tech program. I first started teaching multimedia and then transitioned into college prep and ACT uh, prep. And when I was doing multimedia, I was teaching kids how to make beats. So I started just uploading content for them mm. so that on their off days, they could log on and, and not forget all the stuff that we talked about. And then it started getting, you know, like six digit views. But yeah, hundreds of thousands. I'm not good at math. <laughs> and, uh, so I thought, okay, there's there's actually a need for that. So I did it to an extent haphazardly, but I think I was one of the, the first people to actually create that kind of content. And then, you know, I slacked and then everybody came through mm. and made way better content and way more consistently. So I'm just I'm just kind of now getting back into it. What do you mean by slack? You didn't do it as consistently, you stopped doing it? Yeah, just not consistently. I didn't I didn't have any degree of consistency with, with my upload schedule, with you know, I didn't I didn't see it as a brand builder, you know, cause I was just focused on making the music. Mm. What are some of the principles that you learned back then that you can apply that you would suggest for others to apply now, especially having that knowledge in that media, in the media field. In the media field. Yeah. Just like promoting yourself online. Oh or, yeah. You know. um, I think it's just, I mean, for me, the reason that I was successful early on, it was, and, and I use the term successful loosely. It was that there was just a need for 
producer content on the internet. You know, now there's a lot of producer content out and there are a lot of producers wanting to create content, but identifying the, the spaces that haven't been filled yet that you can fill, I think that's the most important part. And that goes for anything. I mean, that goes for, for any kind of musician, that goes for any kind of product designer. You know, if, if it's already out there, why compete? If, if, it's, if you're competing in a, in a sphere that's already saturated, why do it? So what, what can I bring to a niche that I've identified as having low competition that I'm actually passionate about? So, you know, people, people you know, beat making, for example, I'm going to upload a bunch of beats that sound like Dream Life or Cash Money AP or something. Like, why? They do it better than me. Mm. And they're already established. Let me do the stuff that, that and that's, that's a lesson I had to learn once I started uploading beats online. But I think that's a great example that kind of epitomizes that, that point. So what do you do to set yourself apart online from um, the cash? It was money? actually Dream Life that had that conversation with me. I can't do an English accent, but he, he just basically said, you know, bro, why are you, you know, don't don't focus on the the sound that other people are doing. Focus on what you're known for because mm -hmm. no one's, you know, I, I think my beats are just kind of, you know, I have these moments where I think I'm all right. And then I have these moments where I'm like, oh, no, I'm not very good. But he said, you know, no, no one can make, these sample based soulful beats like pain one I'm like oh i never thought of it that way mm. and then i started thinking like okay jeezy 50 cent um ludicrous rick ross all the beats that that i got placed in the industry kind of had this similar sound mm. so why am i approaching you know as an independent producer my my upload model in a completely contradictory way to mm -hmm. what worked in the industry. You know what I'm saying? So I just, a lot of beats that I had made, you know, during that era, I just revisited and made sound better. And then I uploaded those and suddenly I'm realizing people are coming and subscribing more and the engagement is going up. So it makes total sense. I mean, in retrospect, it was idiotic to think anything else, but you know, the, just, just the, the competition, if, if it's, I mean, there are ways around it, obviously, but it takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of effort and that's necessary, but you may as well just do what you love and you're passionate about it. You're already known for. So you did all this coming out of Wisconsin. Um, you've had all this, this is all happening while you're in Wisconsin. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So why do you feel that um, a lot of pro producers feel the need to move to either Atlanta or LA or like New York or something? It's one of these major cities. Probably because Atlanta's dope. But why do you think they feel they need to? Like, <laughs> I'm not going to make it here. Uh, like, especially with the internet being here. here. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. Um, I just think, I guess I do know that. I think there's just a lot of misinformation. I think people psych themselves out. Um, but, you know, everyone has different personalities and, and their work ethic kicks in based sometimes on environmental factors. Not always. I think the majority of people, if, if you're in Madison... And you're not building your brand up. You're not going to move to LA and suddenly build your brand. Right, up. right. But in some cases, maybe you you create a situation where you're responding to stress in a positive way, and suddenly your work ethic kicks in, and all of a sudden you're networking like you never have, and you're working, and and, and it pays off. So, you know, I can't tell people how to grind, but um, I I think I I would encourage people to just try to build their brands no matter where they are, you know, don't wait to move. Cause you know, that's, I think that's the danger. It's not that they want to try something. If you want to try to go to LA, you want to try to move to Atlanta, by all means do it if that's going to make you happy. But um, in the meantime, at least get familiar with the, with the lay of the land and start uh, attempting to, to learn what, what you need to, to, to know once you actually get to that point. So you have some kind of foundation for yourself. Mm. That makes sense. I think there's a meme going on right now. It's uh, change starts from within, not from moving to Atlanta. You guys seen? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, you're unique because <laughs> how many people, like a million people, moved here last year? For real? I think is that that's the statistic. I know by twenty. I think they said within the next ten to twenty years that Atlanta's population is supposed to grow by one point three million, something like that. Oh something crazy. I'm sorry, guys. 
<laughs> Still sound crazy either way it goes. <laughs> right, right. Where um where where are you most comfortable um making beats or finding your inspiration? Are you more of a studio producer? Do you yeah. definitely studio not at home at home? Uh, and it makes a buzz. Yeah, no, at home home studio, my bad. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, okay. But then, you know, at the at the Airbnb that that um that way it's me, Dream Life, B Demons, DG. Well, there are a couple other producers there. Shout out to Beat Demons, man. Yeah, shout, yeah. shout out to all of them. But we've, I just, I guess I draw inspiration off just being in the presence of really amazing producers too. So, uh, like last night, that's the reason. That's the reason I'm so subdued right now. I'm not DJ Khaled hype, <laughs> but usually I'm not looking like I'm just about to collapse. But it's part of it was I flew in at four in the morning. But the other part was that. Yeah, we were up until four in the morning once again making beats. So, you know, I can in my head, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I'm most comfortable at home. But then when I get put in a situation with other artists, I think just the energy, it it, it invigorates you to the point where you're just your output is crazy. Yeah, sound like it goes back to that competition thing that you was talking about earlier. Yeah, in a weird yeah, way, yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's, right. it's like collaborative competition where mm-hmm. it's just like I want to make something. That I know Beat Demons is gonna mess with. I want to make something yeah. that I know it's DG like is gonna want to add drums to. You know what I'm right. saying? Because if I come out with trash, then I'm messing. I'm the one messing up messing the process. The vibe. Yeah, I'm the weak link, so I don't want to be that. Now, do you um, do you? I know that you sample a lot more, and do you find it? I guess the question I'm looking for is, what's the transition like into this new era where sampling is kind of frowned upon? by younger producers in this new wave. And why do you think they frown upon her? I just think they don't know what the history is, what the uh, mentality of producers who sample is, what the intentionality is. And then I also just think they're, they've been spooked by bad information. You know, because mm-hmm. the the information is out there. You know, don't sample, you'll get sued. Right. But that's, I've never been sued. People don't get sued for sampling. They get sued for releasing music that generates a bunch of money that they never end up yeah. clearing. So I, I just say, you know, don't get spooked. But I don't I don't know that it's, you know, like the Juice World song, that's a sample. Which one? It's a hit record. Lucid uh, Dreams. The Lucid mm-hmm. Dream. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's alive and well. I mean, uh. Lil Duval, <laughs> sample. Yeah. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's not going anywhere. Right. And even some EDM records, some pop records, there are samples, there are interpolations. And then the new school sample creators like the Frank Dukes and the G Coops yeah. and Q Beats and Ant-Man Wonders and Dream Lifes. Um, I mean, they're providing sample clearance guaranteed material to producers because that sound, that texture, that sonic quality is something that we always want. It's just so attractive because that's the culture of hip hop production. So mm, right. it's not going anywhere. It's just, it's changing. And I think, I think that's dope that it's, that it's evolving into what it's become now. Talk to us about what does the sample clearance process look like? I don't know. I've never done it. You've never cleared it? The labels usually do it? Yeah, well, because yeah. the thing is, from what I understand, I mean, number one, so every every song is owned in two ways. So on the one hand, it's the master. On the other hand, it's the composition. Mm-hmm. So the composition, that's what's governed by the PROs. And then the other, the master, that's governed by copyright law. So whoever owns the copyright, generally the label, and whoever owns the composition, generally every single artist involved in the creative process, you have to contact and clear with. Otherwise, that sample doesn't um, isn't authorized for use. So just a matter of tracking those people down is an intimidating prospect for somebody who's never gone through it. You know, like an unsigned artist, they don't have those resources. Then it's time to negotiate once you actually get all those people involved. And then you're sitting there with your fingers crossed, hoping that the content doesn't offend any single person involved, you know, in, in the conversation to the point where they just, nah, I reject that. Cause that happens a lot, you know. Yeah. Especially a lot of you know a lot of artists are religious, so if the content goes against their religious principles, then they reject it. You seen about uh, what Lil Wayne said about Drake on Carter Five? No, what he said. He said like uh, 
Drake wasn't on the album because the sample didn't get cleared on the record he was, so he took the record off. That's what uh, So he, people was like anticipating Drake to be on there, and he just pulled the plug on it. He was like, yeah, sample didn't get cleared. He said they didn't like it. Like the record, they felt like it was too raunchy for yeah. based on what the sample or the original record was. Mm-hmm. I think that's important also because a lot of producers think it's their responsibility to clear the sample before they even sell the beat. Right. And this this is proof that that's not the case because you got you to gotta clear the lyrical content. Like the beat's not going to offend somebody. It's what it's what's written to it. Mm-hmm. So you so you have to clear the whole song. So whatever entity is distributing the full song and is taking ownership of that full song. Once I sell a record, if it's sample based or not, to the label, it's a work for hire anyway. So now they own the copyright. It's out of my hands. It's their responsibility to clear it because they're the ones that that are going to make the most money off it anyway because they own it. So right. like Beat King said, you can't disrespect somebody with a snare. Well, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that quote. Yeah. Yeah. He said you can't disrespect somebody with a snare. So oh. for an independent artist, you know what I mean? Like they got no no major songs, nothing. You know what I mean? They're just they might be rapping over a sample beat. Would you tell them, hey, I wouldn't go uploading sample stuff to like distro kid and stuff like that? Or would you say, hey, man, if it works, I would see how far I get you. I wouldn't give legal advice on that. He wouldn't. <laughs> I, I don't personally know anyone who's been penalized too severely. I mean, at that point, I, I doubt that anybody's going to, you know, suing is a really difficult tedious. it's tedious <laughs> it's and, expensive. So it's and expensive so if if i were one of these labels i would just shut it down or i'd monetize the content or i, I think my prediction is moving forward in in those kinds of instances like a cover or a sample or something that's uncleared the the rights holders are just going to come and, and monetize it if it's doing well if not they probably just either ignore it or just shut it down just kick it off yeah. it no, something that caught my attention is you said when you're clearing the sample, it can't offend anybody that was involved in making the music, right? So does that not, that's not just the artist. Who else does that include? Does that include the band, like the guy playing the trumpet or the lady doing the violin or? If she's included as a writer, then yeah. I think traditionally session players aren't, which is, that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. They do have a, session players do have a union. Uh, Cause I remember my friend Memory played guitar on, a, on that Ludacris record. And he, he got a check from the union, and then he also got some paperwork from the union. But I didn't read over it because I, I don't know. It wasn't mine. But, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I think that's kind of weird that people creating the music don't often get written in as, as writers. But that can always change. It just depends on the people negotiating the the splits i can see how it could be difficult for an entire orchestra or something it's 23 <laughs> right. people how are you gonna split? like nah bro that lyric right there i didn't like it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so so i yeah but usually it's you know the songwriters and i think a lot of people that get sampled the the, the artists that performed it might not if they're not written in as a creator because they didn't write the song then maybe they're not even a part of the conversation i don't know what do you see the main function of the union for? You said the um, session people, players. Yeah. What do you see the main function for them? I don't. I mean, I uh, imagine just the same function that any any kind of union, any trade union would be. Mm-hmm. Just you know, worker protection, advocacy, that kind of thing. Now, uh, Sunny Digital, he's been pretty uh, avid about talking about a producer's union, saying mm-hmm. he thinks it's a good idea. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, if someone can create it, it's it's it wouldn't be easy. But I would certainly support it. Seems like it would have to be someone's life mission to really. Oh yeah, if not and not just one yeah. person. A lot of yeah. a lot of people putting their heads together. Yeah, have to be a movement. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it would have to be. Most definitely. Um. So um. Well, uh, you know, there's there seems to be a big misunderstanding between the leasing and exclusive. Now, we've talked about this, you know, especially with the Jermaine Dupri, um, you know, meme that was yeah. going around. I know you've been pretty vocal about that. Why do you think there's such a confusion between leasing and exclusive rights? And um, what uh, what are your thoughts on, on it? You know what I mean? I think there's just there's confusion in the music business, period, because none of us walked into the music as creatives. None of us walked into the music industry saying, I want to research copyright law. I want to research the Copyright Act of 1978 or whatever it was. 
I want to learn about um, intellectual property. I want to learn about mechanical royalties. We just want to make music. Mm. So as long as we're making music, we might digest inf- misinformation that's out there because we, we don't know how to discern good information from bad information. And unfortunately, then you just kind of perpetuate the myths that, that you accept. Like when I was a kid, I had older people telling me, yeah, just mail yourself a CD. All right. And that's been a myth. It's, but then I find out that in the UK, you actually can do that. Mm. So mm. it must be something that just came from overseas and we just accept it as a fact when it, it's actually not true at all for the United States copyright law. But um, yeah, I mean... What was the question, man? I'm half asleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to talk to you about that. Why do you think I want to get back to? Oh, with the leases and exclusives. Yeah, I, I just so. Um, Can you the, clarify the difference for the, our listeners? It's just exclusivity. I mean, they're both licenses, so I don't think any producer should. So when I said work for hire um, originally, in the in the context of the conversation about major placements, major labels will. I think in all cases, with even with the artists, like with the LMA situation, when people are like, I can't believe that bitch would sue Jacquees. She didn't sue. She didn't even own the songs because the majors, the labels that she signed to own the songs. That's what work for hire is. It means your employer owns your products that you create for them and they're paying you for that. Producers are the same way. If I produce a record for any major artist, they're going to send me a five figure check and in exchange for that, and a lot of people are like, oh my God, five figures. But in exchange for that money, I give up my copyrights. Mm-hmm. And the reason they do that, I imagine, is just because if if I still am the owner of that beat, whatever opportunities they want to um, take advantage of for that song, if they want to license it to a film, if they want to uh, distribute it on, on any one of these platforms they have to consult me so that right, would just be right. a major headache for them so they just pay and they they take the um the the ownership of the copyright aka the master now i think a lot of people equate that with an exclusive sale right. which is not the case you know it's whatever you put in the in the agreement so i don't you know if you're a lot of producers are online selling exclusive licenses for you know 200 250 that's not worth giving up your entire copyright oh. for so i mean in the, I, I i'm i'm a member of beat stars i imagine other platforms when they have their um their, their their lease agreements that they send out automatically i know for a fact the beat stars the agreement has this it's not a work for hire agreement so the producer still retains their their ownership of the record it's just that now who the artist that that got the exclusive license um is the sole licensor. So nobody else can license from that point on. Mm. So a lot of artists just like having exclusivity because it, it feels like they have more ownership over the record. They believe in the record more, but I, honestly, I mean, I understand. And I, I, I just think any kind of lease is a good compromise in, in the, in today's market. I mean, you want to make music, if you have an idea, if you have inspiration, it's a very quick way to get those ideas out. And once the record is recorded, you have all these different options of where to take it. So it's affordable for everybody. Producers are making money. Uh, artists aren't, you know, spending a ridiculous amount on that. So so that frees up some of their budget for stuff like marketing and equipment and, and music videos. I think it's a good compromise. Now, speaking on the topic of like leasing beats and exclusive beats, we've heard in the past that you've had beats stolen from you. Mm-hmm. Um, walk us through that process. Like, what was your mindset when it happened? What'd you learn from it? Um, any future tips to give to people that may experience this moving forward? You'll have to give me an example because that just happens all the time. Really? <laughs> some are, I mean, some are worse than others. I mean, I've spoken on the situation with the record I did for um, King L that got stolen by uh young bird and that was that was pretty demoralizing because i'm like why would another artist do this to me a a rich you know he's worth millions you know what i'm saying why would you do that to me when i have nothing um 
So that that hurts more because I think when an artist, when a recording artist goes online and rips my my beat off of YouTube, they don't they don't mean to be malicious or anything. Cause a lot of them will even tag me in it and say, "Yo, what do you think?" And I'm like, "Well, my tags in it. So did you actually did you did you license this for me? Oh no no my my bad." And then then we just have that conversation, and you know some of them will say, "I'm sorry. What do you need? We'll make it work." Some of them will just say, ah, I'll just delete it. And then some of them will ignore me. And then I just file a DMCA mm-hmm. and it gets taken down. But if it's if it's a matter of the record doing really well, there are other options. I know a lot of producers don't want to burn bridges. So if the record's doing well, then, and it's not registered to you. And so you're not getting any kind of performance royalties or anything. There are ways to, you know, find find the art, do, do a... Um, a search on BMI or ASCAP to see which PRO they're registered with, get their numbers, register it yourself. So now you're getting paid and they're getting paid. So you're not cutting anyone off, but now you get some money off of it. And that money might amount to much more than what you would have gotten from the the license fee. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Or there are companies like Create TV that, you know, in addition to you getting your PROs, you, you work with a company like that and they'll give you money. It's really interesting. It's very difficult for me to explain because I don't fully understand it, but they'll pay you for YouTube um, revenue that isn't traditional content ID revenue. Mm. So it's worth, it because there are a lot of producers out there that never expected to, you know, they're just putting beats online because they love making music and they want to be heard. And then suddenly one of those records goes viral. Next thing you know, it's got a million views and they don't know what to do. So if you have a million views or more on, on a video that, you know, you didn't really get paid for <laughs> contact one of these companies that, that can, that can help with that. And that's like what, like a stream cut or. Um, it's, it's, as it was explained to me, it's technically a sync. So any, mm-hmm. any sync, Synchronization, I mean, te- literally synchronization just means video synchronizing with audio. So every video on YouTube with music is technically a sync. And some of that stuff is royalty free. Some of it is, you know, if it's created by me and it's on my channel, that's, I own it. So I'm, I'm not going to charge myself, but, uh, <laughs> If someone else is on someone else's channel and I didn't authorize it, or even if I did authorize it, it's still, if it's owned by me, if I, this is the importance of owning your masters, if it's owned by me and, and I still control that record, then if it's doing well and someone's making money off of it, that's a sink. I deserve, I deserve a cut of that. So that's how that works. Mm. Talk to us about what should a producer do as soon as they get a major placement or any placement really for that matter? Uh, probably post on Instagram. <laughs> and I say that kind of being sarcastic, but at the same time, a lot of producers aren't really taking advantage of the social media options that they have to brand themselves. So that's a great time to do it because now people are paying attention. And, you know, it's like cross-pollination between your brand as a producer and whoever that major artist is. So... If there's interest, I mean, I ask, I, I interview a lot of producers. I interviewed um, Jay Reed, who just did two se- uh, consecutive singles with Nicki Minaj. Yeah, I shout said, out to Jay Reed. How are you taking advantage of it? And he actually said, producer grind. Yeah. We <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, right away, but it's like you, suddenly you have a story, you know, he, he has a great story working with Nicki Minaj. Mm-hmm. How many producers can say that? And Very his true. story is so crazy. You know what I mean? So take advantage of the spotlight and don't just, don't make it about the mm-hmm. artist, make it about your brand so that you actually have some degree of longevity and you can actually build a, a, a fan base and a base of supporters who care about what you do as a producer from that opportunity. What about on the legal side? Oh, on the le- uh, well, yeah, this <laughs> get a lawyer. This and and I, I think if you're if you're a producer who's um working towards being a career producer and you think there's a chance that you're going to get a major placement, just, I'm not saying hire a lawyer and put them on retainer because that's expensive, but learn about how to contact lawyers, maybe start talking to some lawyers online. 
you know, it's 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 the age of social media. So there are a lot of of entertainment lawyers on Twitter, on Instagram. Just you know, talk to them, network with them. Same way, same way. You know, I networked with with producer grind. Same way, producers network with one another. Just just network with a lawyer. You know, and it's once once it's once it's time when they present the contract and the labels. You know tricking you into, into believing that you only have three days to sign the paperwork, right. then you contact that lawyer and say, okay, I actually need you. What's your fee? And don't be afraid to pay that fee because you do it yourself. I've seen a lot of contracts that just hurt my heart when, when the producer signs it, they said, yeah, I mean, I didn't have a lawyer, but I looked at it and it, you know, I didn't understand it, but I signed it because they told me I had to, or else the song wouldn't come out and I read it. I'm like, oh man. You don't get anything. Basically, work for hire. Yeah, well, work for hire. You still get something because work for hire doesn't take away your um, writer credit. Your writer, your writer share, your publisher share. I mean, it shouldn't. So, you know what I mean. It, it, it's if if I'm not saying that it's common for for people to try to take everything from, and it's not just majors. You know, I'm not turning this into to. Uh, conversation about how evil the the majors are it's it's indies it's unsigned artists that just present these contracts and you know what i mean it it just you just if you don't understand it there's a reason people go to law school i'll put it this way because they can read through that stuff and then the other thing is you know as a producer you don't want to be your own advocate in one of these situations because you should just be making the music you don't need to be pay someone else to be an asshole i mean if it's even if you're paying a lawyer, suddenly you, you've never made a cent off music. You know, like with the Gigi thing, suddenly I'm getting offered four figures. I better pay a lawyer, but I already know I'm getting four figures anyway. So it's not really a loss. I need, I need protection to make sure that this is, you know, a, a, a good, a favorable situation for me. Um, Cause I want to, I want to build off of this. And so I think I that's want, a real mature way to look at it, yeah, though. I think right. a lot of young producers are like, man, I need every penny of that. I'm not giving a lawyer shit. That, and what, what would you say to them? Because um, I think that's a very real mindset. Yeah, but that they can say that. But if they don't understand how a contract operates, how do they actually demand that? Mm. And so if you have a lawyer that walks you through the process and explains to you exactly what every single stipulation means, then you can make a better decision. I mean, if... You know, they'll make an offer. Everything's negotiable. There are certain standards. You know, you're probably not going to get higher than 3% royalty rate. You know, it, you're not going to find a situation where you're like, yeah, I made the beat, but I want 80% of the publishing. That's crazy. So, you know, there there are certain standards, but they shouldn't be trying to take your publishing away. They shouldn't be trying to um, lowball you on the offer just because you're a new producer. You know, there, so there are a lot. They should be giving you point bumps if the album goes gold or platinum. So... There, there are certain things that, that should be in the contract, mm. but if you've never experienced that, how would you know? Mm. As a producer, I feel like when you get a lawyer, you get that sense of security and just freedom. You feel more confident about putting your work out than uh, as in a lot of producers. They, a lot of times they shelf their work because they feel they have that paranoia. Yeah, yeah. that paranoia, that scared like, oh, someone will take my work. Oh, I'm not going to get paid enough. It's like when you get a lawyer, it's like, you just feel free. You that like, peace of I'll mind. I'll go collab with anybody. Yeah. I'll go, yeah. you know, place my beat here and there. I'm, I don't have to worry about that. My lawyer will go ahead. Mm. It just feels different. Mm. But the, the thing with that, too, is just that's why I said network with lawyers early on, because you want to build up a, a, a situation where you trust that lawyer and right. you feel like you can openly communicate with them. Because some people, this is how I was the first time. Um, yeah, the lawyer's just going to handle it. And then... All of a sudden, I'm like, wait a minute. What happened to the publishing? Oh, you sampled. Well, you didn't explain that to me. I, I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm mm-hmm. a kid. I don't know what's going on. So, you know, long story short, I got a different lawyer. And she was actually my friend before uh, she passed the bar. So I could actually have a conversation, call her up and say, you know, what does this mean? And, oh, okay, that makes sense. What, but what's actually standard? Okay, so am I taking a loss here? So that that's I I would say I I really want to stress that you know don't just find a lawyer and think life is all good because you know some lawyers have their ways but they're representing you so what do you want 
you can't just let them take the reins on everything, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and if you're not learning from the process, then maybe reconsider who you're right. working with. Right. Now, I want to talk a little bit about management because um, we're talking about reaching out to get a lawyer. Uh, at what point in your career did you feel like it was necessary for you to reach out and find management? I did that right away. And then I got lucky, you know, because like I said, the, the person, Brandon, um, he's from Toronto. He was just eager to get into management. And so he was active and, shy, you know, but none of us knew what we were doing. It's just we got we got lucky. We had the right kind of energy. Um, but I think in a, in a, in a sense, he's kind of a non-traditional manager mm-hmm. because I didn't have anything to manage at that point. I just had beats. So he, he placed the record and, you know, nowadays I talk to managers and, you know, they're handling logistics and, you know, the stuff that I don't want to handle. Um, and a lot of producers have relationships with artists directly and, that's the best kind of relationship to have with an artist is a, is a direct artist. So, so what I would, is a direct artist, is a direct relationship. So what I would um, say to anybody who's searching for management right now is just ask yourself, is my career currently too much for me to manage? Mm. And if it's not, then why go out of your way to find someone to give 20% to? Because right. what would they be doing? Right. You know what I mean? Everything you get, you're going to have to pay them for so on their end, if you're not getting anything, they're crazy because they're getting 20% of zero. And on your end, if you're getting a little bit of something, but they're not doing anything because you're not overwhelmed to the point where you need them, why are you giving up that mm, money right, to them? Right. So just just keep that in mind. Um, I think a lot of people just like the allure of having a manager. I hate that shit. Really? I hate, I hate let me tell you, there's nothing worse as a creative person there's nothing worse than getting really excited about working with somebody and then having them say, yeah, hey, oh, you talk to my manager before we collaborate. <laughs> Why? Your right. manager is not a creative. I'm trying to make music with you. I, I, that, and I think it goes back to the to people being hyper paranoid mm-hmm. where it's like, I can't work with DJ Payne one because what is he going to try to do? To like me? A distrust. <laughs> just a general I'm just trying to make music. Right. Yeah. Let, let, the, let your manage, manager handle the business. You know, we, he or she doesn't need to get involved in the creative process. Right. Why? Does does your manager write songs? Is your manager a, a keyboard player? Oh, <laughs> cool. Bring him through. But if not, <laughs> you know why? Yeah. Like, I don't know. This pain one seems to know a lot about this music shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I really don't. That's the thing. I just made a lot of mistakes. Mm-hmm. What are some of the things you can expect for a manager to do for you? Because he says, you know, when you're overwhelmed with work, that's when you get a manager. But what can you expect them to help you with or expect them to do? I think that's something you need to talk with them. I mean, what what do you need at that point? You know, when my life gets unmet, so I don't want to deal with bookings because I don't like the negotiation process. It takes forever. And it reflects poorly on me. That's why I say get, get, get a lawyer too. If, if you have, I mean, you should get a lawyer anyway, but the other benefit is that they're the assholes for you. Right. Cause you don't want to be the guy that's, that's cussing people out on the phone. I mean, that's what managers do and no one's going to fault them for it because everyone just knows that lawyers handle that managers handle this. You make the music. And if someone kind of stand by like, Hey man, no, exactly. Hey, you, have, you have plausible deniability hey. because someone would be like, Oh you, man, you, um, your lawyer's really asking for a lot of money, man. And I'm like, you know, he's just good at his job. Yeah, man. Well, I, I don't know. You know, I didn't go, I didn't pass the bar and just make, I make beats with sub bass in it. So right. I just, you want, I, I'll, let me email you some more beats. <laughs> I, know, that, I didn't call to me. I just came up to it. <laughs> I forgot who said, I think they said at our event, they said a manager's job is to manage some, manage a situation that you already have going, not to create a situation right. to manage. And I think some manage, yeah, this, this, that's kind of my new definition of, of, of management. Um, yeah, I, th- I think the, you know, artists, we make music, so we should, we should be able to make music with, with people. And, you know, traditionally, I think we would do label runs or A&Rs would, select beats and then you know the industry is always shifting and, mm-hmm. and at some point we viewed managers as people who were supposed to place records or right. um basically become artist developers or a and r's themselves and you know if that works then great 
Mm. Uh, but I don't, I don't think by definition that's what a manager does. Mm. Cool. Over here. Well, let me ahead, ask a question. Ahead, yeah, yeah. What defines a bad manager for a producer? A bad manager? Yeah. Like, mm. what do you feel like? Good question. A, like a manager shouldn't be doing for producer. Getting, or doing getting credit for their <laughs> for their production. Mm. Ooh, putting their name on the I mean put their tag on it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. If you, if any cuz this happens, you know, if your manager is trying to build their own brand, then that's a conflict of interest. Mm, right. The manager should be trying to manage your brand, not create their own. I mean, if they want to some managers are artists, some managers are producers themselves, some managers rap, some managers just want to build some kind of empire but don't really know how. So if, you, if you're in a situation where you think that the manager has or is putting their brand maybe either right neck and neck with yours or slightly above yours, then that doesn't sound like a good situation for you. Right. It's like having ulterior motives. Yeah, it's just it's because why you know if you're if you're here to manage me, why are you trying to get to the point where I'm less relevant? Shouldn't you're getting a cut of what I'm making? So if continue if, to build me, if I'm built up, you get twenty percent of that. But if you're building yourself up, why do you even need me? So mm. it doesn't it just doesn't make sense. All right. Well, cool. well, we've got a segment on the Producer Grand Podcast called Overrated, Underrated, where we just give you five topics and you simply tell us if you think they're overrated, underrated. And if we want to discuss them more, we'll go ahead and hear what you got to say about them. All right. All right. Cool. So uh, on the first the first topic for Overrated, Underrated with DJ Payne One, starting a beat store in 2018. Uh, underrated. So, uh, yeah, we, we got to hear a little bit more about that because we've had a lot of people say it's overrated. So I want to hear why you, why you starting started. a B store in 2018 is overrated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kato, the producer, is actually the main one that came on and said that. Oh, like starting your own beat store? Starting a brand new online beat store. Like, yo, I'm such and such beats. I got a beat store. Come shop. I just made a account on beat stars. Come no, shop with me. I have to talk to Kato about that. Uh, <laughs> He has a beat store. We all have beat stores. Yeah, we're talking about starting in 2018. Nah, you should definitely start in 2018. I think, what else are you going to do? His, his make... response is because it's very saturated. Like, why would you, yeah, why would you try to jump into something oversaturated already? I mean, music has, is oversaturated. So mm. if you got to make music, you got to find some kind of way to do it. Mm. I don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to start beef with Kato, but... <laughs> <laughs> nah, shout out to Kato. Yeah, all that's the homie. For sure. Well, yeah, I mean, we we're like three way partners in um, Music Entrepreneur right, Club right, right. com, a super dope uh, online mentorship program for producers, rappers, aspiring right. music professionals. Uh, that might be a cool uh, segment. We right. can we can talk about right. that. Yeah, <laughs> full on discussion. I'd definitely be interested in that. Yeah, no, but I'm I'm constantly impressed at how, in spite of the saturation in the online beat selling market how much money is still being like every day people are spending more and more money because it's not it's not as though it's going to hit critical mass and people are going to stop start saying i'm not making music anymore people still have artistic needs mm. so if you sing if you rap if you're a songwriter you, you need music and if you're a producer you need to make music so that re that relationship is always going to happen. It's just you know some people stand out, some people don't, and it it comes down to uh, preparedness. It comes down to luck. It comes down to knowledge. Cream will always rise to the top. Cream of the crop. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, if the cream doesn't propel itself to the top, <laughs> it's going to stay at the bottom. That's a terrible analogy because. But it makes sense though. But yeah, it, you know, I I think in 2018. There's a lot of great music out there uh, and a lot of quality music. I think maybe 10 years ago, you could go online and be like, man, these, these beats are trash. These are, there are very few producers who are uploading great music that's consistent in terms of quality. And the people who were are surviving now and they're still top sellers. But there's just so much more information now. You know, you can go online and learn how to mix. You can go online and learn how to make your sub bass sound way doper. So people are taking advantage of that information and making their music that much better. So there are a lot of great music. And I, 
I've come upon just traveling, just meeting some amazing musicians that are content with making music and not focusing on the marketing at all. So maybe a hundred people will hear their album and that's it. So in that sense, the cream isn't rising to the crop is to the top. It's just kind of staying there and, Mm. you know, it's sad, but not everything can, can reach every single person's ear. One thing that caught my attention that you said is people are, it's surprising to you how much uh, money people are continuing to spend in the money in uh, music, because I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of the mindset is that, man, people don't want to buy beats. People are not trying to spend money. How do you feel about that? Yeah, it's all, it's all relative. I mean, if no one's contacting you to buy your beats, then to you, no one's buying beats. Mm. But if somebody is, you know, if you're like a Taylor King, and in that interview, he revealed that he was making up to 12000 a month off of beats, then people are wanting to buy beats. You okay. know? Right, right. So... And he's someone who's a good example of a consistent producer who makes unique and very high quality and highly musical tracks. So, and there, are, I have the the privilege of knowing a lot of them. So every time I'm feeling like it's unrealistic for me to get to the next income level when it comes to online sales or, or branding or anything like that, I just kind of look at them and they're a living, walking, breathing example of it. Like testimony of it. Yeah. Mm. All right. So the next topic is. Going to a recording school. Because I don't, I don't know, because that's not my universe. Mm. So I don't know, man. My let me rephrase that: DJ Payne one being an engineer, overrated. <laughs> I'm terrible, so I don't know. I probably should have gone to school. Probably not. I don't know. And I think I think experience is a good teacher, but some people need school. Right. I guess I guess I'm really curious to hear from your perspective too, because you're someone that has gone through the education, uh, the educational system, and um, yeah, educational system, and you see, you know firsthand the expense, uh, the investment that you make into oh, yeah. school. And I was just curious to see, with all the resources available online, do you think it's still a wise decision to go to, go to school? Because I know there is. There is some value that you can't get online, like relationships and whatnot, but do you yeah. still think overall it's a wise investment? I think it depends on the person, honestly. So, like I said, some people really need school. It depends on the person and the career. I mean, if you want to become a teacher, yeah, you should go to school. If right. you want to become a lawyer, go to school. But if you want to become a... People ask me all the time, did I, be, did I go to school to become a music producer? <laughs> but I don't really think there are music production schools, right? I mean, I think in the next 10 years, we'll probably see some, but right now it's just kind of a program here or there, maybe class here or there, a workshop. It's not an entire school. curriculum. Yeah. And it'd be cool to have something like that. But maybe, maybe start, I don't know, but um, I, yeah, I, I don't know how to respond to people like that. I, I just say, no, I didn't go to school for that. You can, <laughs> you can learn it on your own. Maybe go to, to school for music. Maybe get, I, I mean, I know some really amazing instrumentalists who went to school, um, but they didn't learn production. They learned their instrument. And then applied it in their production. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. All right, next topic. Um, signing to a major label. Is that overrated or overrated. underrated? I've, I have done that and it's overrated. Why is it overrated? Um, it depends on the deal, but because in 2018, you have access to the very same platforms that the major labels distribute through. So what's the difference at, at this point? Um, and why give up all of your creative control? Why give up uh, control of your release schedule? Why give up your master ownership if you're i mean i can see situations where you would and like if someone if a label offered me three million yeah of course i'm signing right it, right because i'm good after that and i can still make music and find a way to 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 create without um compromising my integrity but the the, the worst part for me as a musician is just having to wait for someone to approve your art and then to to schedule it in and then it's always going to change. That was my experience with a major. It was everything kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. 
and, and I'm looking at the contract, like it says, you were supposed to, you were contractually obligated to release this single two months ago. And you're telling me now that you're pushing it back to the following month. But what are you going to do? Right. Because they own it. Get your lawyer involved. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say, even if they, if they break their contract on their end, you can't do nothing to get more from that. Um, you know, they're smart with the way they structure these contracts. So I think there are very few contractual violations that can result in you as the artist who signed the contract getting out of that contract, you know? So, you know, they're smart. They know what they're doing. Well, cool. That wraps it up for overrated, underrated. I'm going to toss one in here because I always like to toss a random one and just see if it catches. But I'd like to see, do you think Netflix is overrated or underrated? Overrated. What I tell you. What I tell you. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> but and the only reason I'm saying this is because they keep putting out shows and then not announcing uh, whether or not the seasons have been renewed. Mm. Otherwise, mm. I would say underrated. But like Travelers, is there ever going to be a third season? You ever watch Black Mirror? I was going to say, I want some more Black Mirror. <laughs> what is it? You Black, Black, Black Mirror? Oh, oh man. Yeah, it's like a sci-fi. No, but I'm afraid to do that because I, I watched a lot of Netflix. Not a lot, but a few. I don't really watch TV, but when I do, it's not usually Netflix. Um, but then I, I get into the show and then it ends. I'm like, well, when is the next season coming right, out? Right. Well, the contracts haven't been renewed. Well, this one is uh, it's four seasons. And how many episodes do you see? It's like, it's, nah, it's, nah, it's, nah, every, it's like every episode, though, is not has nothing to do with none of the same characters or anything from the last episode. It's like a new story. It's like oh, okay. Twilight so I can Zone. Do that, yeah. It's like Twilight yeah. Zone or whatever. Okay, no, that's dope. I like that format because then you're never left hanging. But all these other shows that at the conclusion of the season, they introduce something brand new. Right. That's the, I mean, they're smart, but the, the tragedy is that we'll never get to know what happened. It was like the X-Files, man. That was such a frustrating show to watch. I never got into X-Files. <laughs> and, yeah, they, and they brought it back, too. And then, yeah, and then they brought it back. And I'm like, too late now. <laughs> I'll probably start watching it, but I don't want to because it's just going to suck me in. And then at the very end of it, you know, here's the end that doesn't make any damn sense. And we, we're not tying up any loose ends. Mm. <laughs> Are you oh, more, uh, last question about Netflix? Are you more of a documentary guy or a show guy, TV show guy? Probably shows because I like reading books and doing mm. other kind of intellectual stuff mm. that isn't in a visual medium. Mm. I don't know why, but if I if I'm watching something, I just kind of want to to relax to to relax and turn my turn my brain off and just be kind of primitive for a little while. What are some of the books you've been reading like just recently that have caught your attention? Oh, I've got War and Peace and it's taken forever. Who? I'm almost done. War and Peace. I Who think it's the that? longest book. Tolstoy. I think it's the longest book ever. <laughs> really? Yeah. How many pages? Like 3,000? Uh, I don't know, man. I'm reading it on Kindle, but mm -hmm. um, I'll probably finish on the way back to Madison, but it's it's long. There's a lot of French in it, and I don't speak French. <laughs> Je ne sais pas français. Je m'appelle Harrington. That's all I know. I know that means. Uh, Je m'appelle français means I don't speak French. Je m'appelle Carrington means my name is Carrington. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. And, and then crude can crayon. someone can someone verify that? <laughs> I, I should be right. I I, first I, class, so. I'm like that's like seventy percent accurate. So uh, we know you're down here. <laughs> We know you're down here for A3C. Um, I've recently seen a few media outlets specifically making a magazine have actually been pretty vocal against A3C, saying that accusing them of capping off of indie artists, promoters, and um, saying that they uh, use indie artists and promoters to fund uh, their major acts at the festival and draw sponsorships. And they've also never really been credited for breaking any new artists. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. I don't really have that level of insight. Um... I'm here through beat stars. And so I really only see that aspect of the, mm. of the conference. So I can't really speak on that. Mm. Sounds like, I mean, we have, we have stuff like that in, in my area too, with, with larger conferences and um, sometimes conferences are problematic. Sometimes people's opinions of them are problematic. So I can't really say. Do we know any artists that have actually been, that have really broke through from A3C? That's what they're saying. See, I'm not, I don't know for sure, but yeah. they're saying that. Is that the purpose of, is that, 
Is that like the mission statement? I'm not, I don't know enough about A3C. Um, from my understanding, like it's supposed to showcase upcoming artists that's coming from all three coasts. Artists and okay. producers. Oh, okay. And, you know, put them in touch with label execs and, you know, the conference is the first half as in the education and the concert is the performance. Mm. And so it's supposed to be all in one. Mm. You know? Right. But I feel like as Atlanta, a lot of people, a lot of like clubs and a lot of people are capitalizing on it. So like South by South. By yeah, yeah. Pretty yeah. much the same thing. Like, what are the, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Of course, like as soon as people come to like, comes downtown, like club prices going up, a lot of prices going up. Obviously you can see mm. like, you know, it's very touristy. It feels mm. very touristy now, mm. you know, in the city. Yeah. Rather than retrospective when there's nothing going on in the city, it's like, it feels kind of normal. Mm. Mm. What are the three coasts? I'm just curious. Uh, Everything but where north? I'm from. <laughs> yeah, east, west, and Is it south, south or is it yeah. north? South probably, because like, it's held in Atlanta. Yeah, I mean, that east coast kind of counts as north coast. I mean, up north, in a sense. I guess so. Mm-hmm. And we just have Lake Michigan, so. And I guess we ain't got no, like, yeah. well, not to say there's no producers in Montana, but <laughs> north, you feel me. So have you ever gone to any um, conferences, like, other than, you know, mm-hmm. not participating, like, actually just gone yeah. as an attendee? Would you say you've gotten pretty good value from it? Um, yeah, some of them. I mean, honestly, my experience here at A3C last year was probably the most valuable, but mm. it was funny because I was thrown into being the moderator for all these Beat Stars panels, and I had never met any of these guys. I had never met uh, the crates. I had never met Cash Money AP, and here I am. So I got to devise questions. But I was at the juncture in my career where I wanted to learn way more about um, what Beatstars was doing because I wasn't really immersed into that world. So I just formulated questions that I thought, you know, I, that I personally as a producer would want to know. And as a result, I think the questions were good because they were really direct. You know, it was like, how do you word your emails when you send out email marketing for for um, your production? How mm-hmm. do you, you know, what what are your daily ad budgets? Very direct questions. I honestly expected nobody to answer the questions and right away, very directly they gave me answers. Mm. So I just went back and applied that and like tripled my, my income because of it. Mm. Um, so for, for artists or I'm sorry, for producers, do you feel um, online like Instagram ads and YouTube ads are effective? For me, they definitely are. Yeah. And uh, what are some of your advice you could give and what type of posts are you supposed to be? A uh, video. I mean, every, all of these, uh, I don't, I don't mean like photo or video, like, what like a video of your beat? Yes, a picture of you. Video of the yeah, probably not a selfie. Vi- um, I think one thing that has come up again and again when when we look at producers running ads is that, you know, you have very limited time, and every format is different. Like an Instagram story is fifteen seconds, a timeline, a Instagram timeline is sixty seconds. Facebook doesn't really have much of a limit. Maybe, I don't know, but but you should make it brief. And drop the beat at at the most interesting part because a lot of people have these long ass intros. So if I'm scrolling through and I just hear this long ass intro that's slowly fading up, I'm just going to swipe past it. But if all of a sudden I just hear the kick come in and if you got a hook, you hear the top line come in, that'll make you pause and consider the whole thing. And then, you know, you're more likely to check out the actual the actual link in the ad. So I would say just make the ads interesting visually and interesting sonically. A lot of people focus on the visual more than than the beat. And at the end of the day, the beat's the most important part. I guess what you're selling. Yeah, exactly. And I guess me, like see, when I see people just, uh, or when I see posts that are just them recording their laptop screen of FL Studio, just the thing going past it and them just shaking it. Like it drives me crazy. It doesn't really draw my interest in. So like, what I do that <laughs> oh, not with FL, but you know, what no, I mean? but then people get mad like, why are you shaking your phone? Like, right, right, right. I mean, like, I, the base. I understand it, but I'm, I'm curious. Like, I want to see, like, I know one thing that I've seen people do more creative, like, no, I'm not saying more creative, but I've seen them take different approaches to Absolutely, it. Absolutely, yeah. And like, it's definitely caught my attention. Like, when I see people making beats like next to a um, like a lake or something, or, like, you know, that's people with the NPC or whatever, but still, it's something unique and something different that I've not definitely yeah. seen. No, like, yeah, it's it's the same with everything. If there's if there's a vacuum, someone's going to fill it. It might as right. well be you. So if right. no one's creating, there was a video of someone skydiving and making a beat. That's, hey, that's yeah, fire. That's crazy. Yeah, so I don't think anyone's ever done that. And it went viral because of that. Right. So mm. do something unique. And I'm, I'm not, 
I for the record, I'm not doing this with the camera. Yeah, and no, no shots fired. On a sponsored, on a sponsored ad. Right. I might do it on an Instagram story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, that's, of course. And but that's I mean, probably like why he doesn't follow me, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been on Instagram in, like, 40-something days, honestly. Yeah, I haven't faster, been, bro. Yeah, well, I started off just 21 days. I was like, I'm going to get off of it because I've been scrolling too much. And then... Um, <laughs> What, what does that mean? Scrolling too much, just like I'm, I'm picking up my phone. Like, too much. did it hurt your thumb? Or no, what? no, no. Like, like on the day to day, I'm, I'm giving too much of my time to this social media, and I'm paying too much attention to other people. I see. Yeah, you know yeah. that cold kind, my um, kind of thing. Like, I, one video I posted was about Denzel Washington, and he was talking about his opinion on social media, and he was saying just put it down. And I was like, you know what? All right, let me. I do feel like says that you it's actually one of the last things you posted. Right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> other than the the UFC fight coming up this Saturday, let's go, Khabib. But, and, but actually, I mean, I'm a McGregor fan, but Khabib is a man. All right now. But um, yeah, I was just I was just uh, curious. Like, I was just I was like, you know, what, let me try it. And I've actually it's brought me a lot of peace. Like, I'm not worried about ding, ding, ding yeah. and so on. But definitely need to hop back on because I feel like someone said that the most dangerous thing that you can do is disappear for too long. And I'm like, OK, I had my time away. Now I can come back in a more, I guess, um controlled way or like i'm not just always on because you understand your relationship with a bad right, guy. right 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 th- yeah i think that's a danger because because the issue too would i mean if you're running a business right you have to use the online marketplace as your primary source of exactly. customers. Yeah. Yeah. Then you can't take yeah you can't take a break i can't take a break if i take a break that's just i'm shooting myself in the foot right and i'm yeah, in a place like my, i'm in a place <laughs> yeah. where i can Down i can i still have a little bit of time where i can take that break but it's it's starting to reach that point where i'm like okay I can't just be MIA and, you know. Yeah, but the dope part is if it's a business, it's not a personal thing and it shouldn't be. Right. So my person, I only have a personal Facebook. I don't have a personal anything else. And I very rarely go on Facebook. And when I do, I'm like, oh, fuck shit. Okay, I'm going back to DJ (laughs) Payne one. (laughs) But even still, like, you know, because obviously if you own a business, you have to post and stuff. But also, man, I... I get good value from scrolling. I see things like, oh, I want to talk about this on the podcast, right? right. Instagram, Twitter, right. or you know what I mean? Or there's a lot of dope stuff on this. I just watch cat videos and like ass <laughs> and, beat, and beats. Right. <laughs> Cats, ass, and beats. Cats what, uh, what, what are some? Uh, what are some like budgets, daily budgets, and stuff that work for you? Um, the advice. I'm not an authority on any of this, so I defer to, to people like Mike Trampy. Shout out to Mike Trampy. Um, He's been a, a a mentor in the game for a long time since the hip hop DX days, and before you know he was doing like PR for for TDE early on, and um, I think it was TDE. I mean it was Kendrick and whatever incarnation of that group Black it was Hippie. back then, and uh, Black Hippie. Yeah, uh, I mean, but it was it was on the label level, mm-hmm. and um, he's probably gonna kill me once he watches. That's not right, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, his, his advice with these budgets is, is start low. I mean, a lot, I think a lot of people think, okay, my, if my budget for ads is 400, I'm going to spend all 400 on these ads. And the issue is from, from my experience, if your daily budget is $3 a day and the ads not working, it's not going to work at 300. Um, okay. So, and it, so if you test it out at three and it's converting, you know, maybe you're cool with that. Maybe you start another ad at three and run that concurrently. And Facebook has a thing and you know, it's, it controls your ads on Instagram and Facebook. They have a thing called split testing. So I encourage people to, to check that out because mm-hmm. it gives you insight as to whether, and I've done this recently, I, I split test. It, it allows you to run identical ads with, with, vary, with varying parameters. So mm-hmm. I wanted to try out just Instagram stories, but compare it with the Instagram timeline to see what the difference was. Mm. Uh, and then I split test between just Instagram as a platform and just Facebook as a platform. And Instagram actually won. So over Facebook, over Facebook. Yeah. Wow. What are you getting better traction from the stories or posts? For, for that particular ad set stories. Mm. Mm. So, and it's kind of, it's surprising, right? So that's, that's the benefit of, of doing that research. Cause my experience might not be your experience. Mm-hmm. So that's why you have to do that, that research for yourself. But I, I spent like, you know, Thirty dollars, figuring that out. I didn't spend eight hundred dollars. A lot of people are saying, "Yeah, I, I spent like two hundred and fifty dollars a week off ads. I'm like twenty five hundred dollars in the hole, and I sold three beats." It's like, well, damn, we spent a lot of money. What? Why? Because they thought you know, bigger investment, bigger return. But if the ads aren't optimized correctly, 
you're not going to make that that money back. And you might not make that money back, period, if you're just starting because you have to build a customer base. You know, the point of, I forget, I saw in a video, uh, and it was very eloquently put, it was this woman who made an ads video, and the quote was something to the effect of social media is not meant to sell products. Social media is meant to generate interest in the business. So mm -hmm. if you're going into the ads world thinking, I'm going to invest money and immediately get a return, then that's the, that's the wrong approach. Um, it's, I want to, I want to create interest in my brand so that I, I build some kind of a, uh, base of people who are interested, who will likely purchase. And once they purchase, that's a customer that I need to turn into a return customer. I don't just abandon them after they make that sale. Mm, follow up. Yeah. Do you, um, do you use Snapchat at all? Oh God. Um, yeah, kind of, not really, mm. sort of. Just curious, because I feel like Snapchat's kind of been on, um, hasn't really been talked about much lately. Kind of on the down. I don't, man, because every time, like, you know, do you have little kids in your family that nah, are on Snapchat? They love Snapchat. No. My little sister. That's all they do, but then they do that stupid, I see, I sound like an old man, but they do that streak <laughs> thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, just yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Every morning, my little sisters, I get a streak post. Yeah. And it's like, why? I don't get it. Because your numbers go up, but what do those translate to? So. Oh, is that what it's for? Yeah, because your streak, your that that number by your name goes up. Like you Snapchat someone for two hundred days straight. So I was like, why does my little cousin have a fifty thousand by his name, and I got like a three thousand by my name? He was all good streaks. So <laughs> it's like a picture of his. He, he'll send a picture of his foot to his friend, and then his friend will send a picture of the ceiling back. And then he'll send a picture of the floor to him. And then he'll send a picture of a chalkboard to him. Keep the streak and alive the at street. all e, uh, wow. by all means. And like, you, you realize that your carbon footprint is entirely based on your need to streak with your friend because you keep having to charge your battery. That's irresponsible. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a poor global citizen. <laughs> Plus over, over three years, how much time do you think yeah, you spent? Over. You know, just you know what I mean? Right, right. right. It probably equates to a pretty good amount of time. Yeah, learn how to make beats or something instead. Yeah, right. Well, I guess that's part of being a kid, though. You do stuff that we just don't yeah, understand. Right. So, um, in general, do you think you like working with up-and-coming artists or, or major artists more, besides the pay? Um, I just like working with artists that are dope. If I can work hands-on with the artists, then great. And if that artist uh, is successful, then even better. I mean, that the, the cool, like the artists that I work with, very close two artists that I've been working with very closely. Raul, he he um has been featured in Bollywood films, which is hmm. the number I think it's the number one music. I mean, it's definitely the most prolific group of musicians in the history of music. Uh and then Ted Park, who's from my city, but he just signed with a Korean label, uh, because hmm. he's Korean American. And um they're both they're both starting to do well, you know. And that's that's great to me because it's the best of, of all three worlds. One, we have the chemistry. Two, we have music that, that we all like. And then three, there's the, the growth of the brands. So if you can find f those three, and then the fourth is like millions of dollars, but that, those haven't come yet. But when they come, that's the best possible case scenario. You know, I mean, even, yeah, if you make $3 million tomorrow off of a, a, a track that, you made with someone that you never actually met and you didn't really, you know, produce yourself. You made the beat, but you didn't produce the song. That's cool too. You got $3 million, but you know, the soul of an artist wants to really be a part of that creative process. And so I, I love that process. I absolutely love that process. Mm. Ooh. You know, like really producing vocal producing, um, tracking, advising the engineer, you know, creating, you know, adding effects, Pretty much everything short of, of actual engineering I'll do because anything creative, my creative limits as an engineer, they go to the engineer and, and that's their art form. Um, but just, you know, controlling the vision of the record and really seeing it come together right before your very eyes with an artist with whom you have that musical chemistry and, and who you respect, that's, there's nothing better than that. Do you feel like um, engineers depending on their input on the creative process process deserve credit uh, for creating or contributing creatively to the, to the uh, finished product. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Especially nowadays because engineers are 
a lot more on the creative side with go ahead there's a lot more <laughs> producers and engineers yeah you know what i'm yeah. saying playing multiple roles sometimes as the producer you gotta put on different hats yeah but true. sometimes it may not always be an engineer hat it might be a management hat it might be a pr hat it might be something else you know what i'm saying just what you right. what else you're good at in helping the situation mm. Just be engineer all the time. Be different things. I know producers that also manage the artists. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, so uh, we're not gonna let you get out of here without telling us about this Wendy's place, man. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I need to. Can you pull up the? Because I forgot the producer's name. It, so it was. It's weird. It was that someone contacted me and said, "Yo, you're on the Wendy's mixtape." Because because when when I, I can't believe we're having this conversation. Man, put a plaque on his wall. The fact that that Wendy's put a project out <laughs> that's so dope though like that's that so far crazy. it's I mean yeah no one would have thought that a fast food chain would drop a mixtape mix <laughs> who was the rapper on that do we know we got a beat battle or a rap battle between McDonald's employees and Wendy's employees <laughs> yo that, uh, McDonald's got yeah, so he, that, that's, that was real then yeah but he said he did it for work for hire. He did well as in he sold his rights. He don't get royalties on that. Damn. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I, he that's he got paid was. like five hundred thousand, but he said he oh, wish he fine. kept his royalties. Okay. Yeah. Vision because he was still get paid to today. My, 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 my bad. My bad. Oh, okay. Um. So a producer by the name of Vision with a Z had used one of my loops to create a beat that he got on the Wendy's mixtape. Mm. So I mean, I connected with him. It was cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just go through, just go through the drive-through. Yeah. Got a place. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you see royalties you? from it? Uh, no. <laughs> I just kind of let it go. I'm mm-hmm. like, I don't know what's going on. You hit up Wendy's at least get a lifetime lifetime supplies of like frosties or something. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no comment on that. I'm trying to be <laughs> healthy and not eat. Like yeah, for sure. I guess I got a quick question. How many um placements have you got off making loops? Mm. And how do you feel like that has been helping you, I guess, in the placement? Okay. Um, a few, but the the concern is that when you release those loops, I mean, you can, you can put your information out there, you can be accessible, but you're relying on the producer to report that to you. And I've certainly been in a situation where the producers don't report that to you, mm. and then the paperwork doesn't get handled, and it becomes... Um, you know, a, a pain. Mm. So I, I hate that part of the game, but I think it's, it's genius. I think, you know, just like leasing beats is a great compromise between unsigned rappers and, and independent producers. I think um, this is a, you know, uh, releasing non royalty free, mm. but really quality uh, sample libraries is a great compromise for producers who love sampling but don't want to deal with the hassle of clearance. Because mm, yeah. all it is is, you know, as a producer, if you if you sample something and you get a placement, there's a good chance most, if not all, of your publishing is gone. But yeah. if you use the sample that another producer created, they might only want 10, 15, 20%. So, and there's no hassle. They're not getting any of your events and they're not going to hold up the process. Mm. So you're guaranteed to get that placement. No one's going to pull the to, the rug out from under you because of the content of the record. And it's not a big pain to negotiate because the sample clearance process didn't actually happen. Mm. It's just kind of like a, a co-production situation. Mm. So everybody wins. For producers that sell and release sample pack or sample libraries, is there anything special that you need to do to to, to let this be known? This is not a royalty free pack. I think, yeah, just create um, license information that, that people need to read. I mean, the, the, the beauty of copyright law is that the second you create anything, you own the copyright to it. Mm-hmm. So um, probably if you really want to be safe, copyright the, the whole collection and then include the, the information and as much information as possible. I, I include everything, contact information, um, my PRO information, just in case you don't even want to contact me, you just want to register it. Great. By all means, do it. Make the process easier for me. Uh, but, you know, if something happens, you can't say, well, I didn't have the information because it's right there. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so 
I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. This is all very new. This is still something that we're going to see evolve a lot in the near future. Mm. A lot, a lot. But I think, I think first and foremost, what producers need to do if they're creating a kit is just create a really good kit so that people really want to use it. Mm. You know, make it, make it as dope as possible. Mm. Also, definitely want to pick your brain on the Music Modernization Act. Because it's kind of oh, confusing. Yeah. I'm going to admit, it's kind of confusing. It is, me. yeah. I wanted to... <laughs> this is why... I, I don't, this is the day yeah. I almost gave up Twitter. Because I um, I put out a tweet. I was like, "Does it, can anybody refer me to someone who knows a lot about the Music um, Modernization Act? I would like to interview them. And all these people were like, well, I this is what I understand it as. And, oh, it's basically... I'm like, I don't want that. I want right. to interview somebody so I can create long form content and give it to the community for free so everybody can understand it because there is a lot of confusion and I don't understand it. Mm. But I think if I ask questions from the perspective of a producer to someone who does understand it, then they put it in a language that, that our community will understand. And then hopefully someone who's a songwriter can do the same, someone who's a manager can do the same, someone who's um, just interested you know, as as someone who's not even in the industry, you know, they, they can understand it too, because it's it's something that that uh does have pretty serious implications. Mm. That's, that's my political, I don't really know what I'm talking about answer. Yeah. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough though. But, but so but, but any, somebody well, you know, contact me. Though. Somebody <laughs> contact me and and that you know, figure it out. That made pretty 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 good sense. Yeah. We'll definitely reach out to Pain One, please, so we can get that content. Yes, please. 100%. Or producer grind. Yeah, for sure. Or both. Yeah. Because I just do Skype. They actually have an office. <laughs> <laughs> um. So what can we expect from me in 2018, man? Or I mean, not just 2018, the next, you know. 2019. Yeah, the next, you know, few years. 2020. Uh, definitely <laughs> watch, definitely watch Ted Park. Um, my, cat, my online production catalog is going to go up. I have a lot more brand partnerships that are in the works. Um, I'm going to create a lot more producer content. If you thought I was already creating a lot, I'm going to create even more. Mm. And aside from that, I don't know. And that's, that's the exciting part about it. You never know in, in, in this line of work, what's going to happen, <laughs> but um, hopefully it's all good. Oh, definitely, man. Um, let everyone know. Let everyone know where we can check check you out on social media. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty accessible on social media at DJ Pain One. Pretty much everything except Facebook, and you just type DJ Pain One in there. There was a fake DJ Pain One that took my logo, and <laughs> DJ and, Pain Two. No, he, he called himself DJ Pain One, and I don't know how he snatched up the the username, the handle, because it wasn't available to me Damn. when I first signed up to Facebook. So I'm DJ Payne O-N-E and he's DJ Payne number one. Wow. Mm-hmm. So I reached out and he was, he was in some Latin American country. So in Spanish, I told him, take that off. And why are you using my logo? Change your name. He's like, no, I didn't, I didn't model myself after you. I'm like, bro, you took my logo. <laughs> yeah. And my name. Yeah. So it's a lot of weirdos Hit out there. Hit them with that DMCA or DCMA, whatever it is. Uh, but you can't because that's trademark yeah, and DMCA definitely. is copyright. Uh, a lot of people confuse the two. So you you have to have the logo trademarked or whatever? Oh, uh, well, you have to have the name no, trademarked. Yeah, name. Yeah. yeah. So he took the logo down and I'm like, that doesn't help. Yeah. You're still saying you're DJ Payne 1 and you're clearly not DJ Payne 1. <laughs> DJ Hurt 2. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, definitely, man. Yeah, so DJ Payne 1, DJ Payne 1 Beats.com. Um, DJ Pain One, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube is a little different, but just go, just search DJ Pain One. I'll come up. You'll find him. Yeah, definitely appreciate you making some time. While you're yeah, here, thank you, thank brothers, you, man. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate yeah, it, man. I'm gonna go back to Happy the A3C. house and, and make a mm-hmm. bunch of beats. Yes, sir. Oh, it's only 10:30. Yeah, I'm good. Shout out, <laughs> shout out to D Sims for oh being yeah. part of the podcast. Yeah, appreciate y'all having me for the first one and having the legendary Pain One, man. Been listening to him since high school, so it's an honor to have you. Oh, so, uh, hey, thank you. For sure. <laughs> All righty, man. Another episode of the Proof Grand Podcast. Peace.